four on our yearly leaderboard for player of the year against Eric the Thrill Real. Now, Eric Real is kind of interesting here. Eric Real has won five SEG Tour Opens. He's won three of them in Ohio. And this is actually his last Open for a while because he's moving to Denver after this tournament. A lot of people moving to Denver. Yeah, people want to hang out with you, I guess. I guess. What's going on there? He, hey, you can add him to, to a draft. Could. You can play a little the bit. The Kiefer's, they live in Boulder. They're very close. How far, how far is Boulder from you? Uh, about half an hour. Oh, that's been, it? Wow, okay. I haven't been there yet, but uh, apparently it's a half an hour. I hear Boulder's a delight. Yes. I've heard a lot of good things about Boulder. Never been. We need to have a Grand Prix Boulder. SCG Tour Boulder. I mean, we, about that? We, we, could we could just go to Denver, and then people could drive 30 minutes outside the city if they wanted to do that. Well, maybe Boulder's nicer than Denver. Why has it always got to be built around Denver? Um, it just that's where the airport is. Is in the, the, the hotel. The airport's in the middle of nowhere in Denver. Um, it's outside the city limits, but it's yeah. not the middle of nowhere. It's about a half an hour from downtown. That was my cab ride. Yeah, at least. I don't know. Every time I've gone to Denver, it just it feels like it's just in a field. Well, the the Crown Plaza, the venue that's typically been held for SEGs and uh, the Grand Prix, yep. I would not describe as downtown Denver. No, it's not downtown Denver at all. No, it, it almost feels kind of the outskirts of. Some industrial yeah, whatever. Yeah, like an industrial parkway. Right. Kind of. Nice enough area, but I've always felt the Denver airport is just like, whoa, what are you doing out here? Play the game, see the world, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you see Ross and Real going to shuffle up here and get ready. You ever want to see one. the, the uh, commercial slash industrial warehouse section of Edison, New Jersey? Thankfully, Grand Prix and SEGs go out there all the time. You get to see, you get to see all these different landmarks of of the United States as a consequence of playing Magic. That's right. It's a lot of, you know, at least for this venue, Columbus. We are in downtown Columbus. And it's a great convention center. Indianapolis, much the same. We do go to some centrally located venues, and but we're, we're, not across the board. We're right around the corner from Ohio State, too. Yeah. Here. Ohio State's campus is, you could sneeze and hit it. And it's enormous. Yep. It's got to be one of the largest public it, universities in the United States, right? So I went to Purdue. And I, I, like, I, everyone tells me that campus is big, but a lot of people go to small schools, mm -hmm. or a lot of campuses are just small. And I never felt it was big, even though kind of looking back at it, and I have to, you know, walk across the campus to get to a class, which takes like 15 minutes. So I guess in theory that makes it pretty big. Mm -hmm. Ohio State, that's just, that's nothing. Right. It's so, it's like frightening how big it is. I would just, I would say, I went to Seton Hall, which I would describe as a medium-sized, small medium-sized institution. Because I've talked to players like Ross Merriam who went to Harvey Mudd, and he's just like, yeah, there's 500 people there. Right. You know, there's no one there. As we're underway here in game number one, for Eric, really, he's going to start from the evolving wild, sacrifice that for a planes. For Tom Ross, well, he's got a planes as well, and he's going to start with a dragon hunter. So he had a real's way. He'll draw a card. Fortified village, reveal a forest. And now a hangerback walker. This is a very play draw biased matchup as well. Battlefield Forge, a big draw there for the boss. That's land number two. And now we'll see how Detective Ross, as we've been calling him this week, and mm -hmm. wants to move forward. Cracking clues. Mm -hmm. Thumbing his mustache. I talked to him yesterday. He said he's. If we, want to, if we want to get a handlebar, he's in. Great. Yeah. And I, who would say no to That's that? not even up for debate. Yeah. He said, whatever I got to do to get the views. That was the, <laughs> that was, <that's, laughs> that was the quote. <laughs> An expedition envoy and a anointer of champions for Tom. Let's go back to over to Eric. Another fortified village revealing a forest. Hangerback Walker with the ability to grow into a 2 2 now at the very least. I think real with Dramoka's command in hand. So he's got two lines of here, which is. Try to sit back on the hanger back walker and blow Tom out when he makes a move, or just get in while the getting's good. Well, he's just going to put a counter right now on hanger back walker and finish off anointer champions. Okay.
See, we're on turn, we're on turn three, and Eric Riddle's still at 20. Yep. You don't see that very much against humans, let alone against Tom Ross. And I think without Griff's boon or without always watching, Tom just kind of has to build up a board and go wide. But that's going to be very challenging to do with Rilla 20 and a handful of spells. Mm -hmm. Now the White Orchid's going to search up the planes, given Rill's land advantage. And now Ross is going to play a Kithian. And pass that turn back, so no good attacks to be had. Hangerback Walker is going to go up to a 3 3, real one tap. Time to draw. We know he's got a forest in hand. The question is, what else is hiding out over there for Eric? There is the forest. Only three cards in hand for real. Although the concern has to be from Rill's side of the table is if he's sitting back and just trying to moat Ross out with this hanger back walker, should Ross have declaration in stone, then everything gets blown up. So we can't be confident just sitting back on this hanger back walker unless he has a way to blow it up at instant speed. There's a hanger back walker. I think that'll be it for Rill's turn. So Ross will draw. He's drawn a planes. There's another Dragon Hunter in hand, a Thaddeus Lieutenant. If Tom's hand is just a bunch of creatures, which kind of looks like right now, it, there is not a whole lot of ways to go around these hanger back walkers. Yeah, I think the card that he actually wants to draw, given the three-man inspector here, is there's a Dragon Hunter. And now here is a Thaddeus Lieutenant, so these creatures are all going to get a lot larger. He's looking for Declaration in stone. Yes. Although I guess at this point, he, I don't think he can really muster an attack this turn, but next turn... He starts looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven attackers against two blockers. Mm -hmm. He may be able to go wide over the course of several turns. No, I know you've got Eric's deck list in front of you. Are we looking at any tragic arrogance here? One copy. Okay. Be a good time for that. Be a game winner. Real's just going to pass the turn back. Yep. Ross will untap and draw. Sacrifice a clue. Always watching, I believe. And he's also found a copy of Expedition Envoy. Thaddeus Attendant will grow. Is it time to start attacking? Guess not. There's Archangel Avison. Draw a card. Now, if Archangel Avison transforms, that's bad news as well. Yes. But if Tom's able to get always watching on the battlefield, maybe he can have his creatures survive. Archangel Avison's transformation. So, And at the end of the day, it's only one more blocker. If Ross's plan is to just kind of go wide with tiny creatures, he might prevent, be able to prevent the trigger. Although I guess if, if Rill is committed to leaving the hangar back walker small, it, Ross is kind of locked out for the time being. Mm -hmm. You saw Rill play an Evolving Wilds pass to turn back. I believe Rill only has one card left in hand. And I like Rill here not growing the hangerback walkers. It's kind of an instinctive play to just go ahead and do that. Yep. But I think he wants to make sure the hangerback walkers have the option of trading, making a bunch of thopters, triggering Avison, and so forth. Well, Tom found Declaration in stone. All right, well, that is a, that's the draw right there. Yes, it is. That means hangerback walkers are gone, exiled, clues to be given, but no thopters to be made. And now we might just see Tom say, all right, let's turn up the heat, turn them all sideways. This feels like a fine spot here to just start sending in the knuckleheads over the course of two or three turns and hoping it's good enough. Yeah, Evolving Wild's going to be sacrificed here by Real, and I think we're going to see him start breaking clues to get a little bit of help here. Yeah, thinning out the deck first, sacrificing the Evolving Wilds, and then break open the clues, hope to find something to do. Tom's last card in hand isn't always watching, just doesn't have the ability to cast it right now. So Eric will start by cracking a clue, drawing a card. We might see him crack the other clue here, but Archangel Avison's going to have to block something. And the best thing to block might just be Kithian, especially because it would transform yep. if you don't block that one. So Kithian down, whole lot of damage dealt. Life total will be updated in just a moment. Rill will sacrifice a clue, draw a card. He'll head his way. Six lands. He's at two. 
Well, I guess he doesn't want Avson to, to flip anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> that's awkward. And he actually drew hanger back walker. So he, in a lot of circumstances, he could just play this for zero, but I don't think we're in that one now. So Oath of Nyssa here from Rill. Found a Gideon along with a Westville Abbey. Tom just keeps doing it. Yeah. Opponents have good starts. Some of the best cards in the matchup. So far, so good. There's hanging back Walker for zero. There's a land. Does Real have some way to gain life that I'm not seeing? There's Gideon. Okay. Attack for four. Got to confirm that Eric's life total is actually two here. Yeah. Maybe oh, I'm I'm mistaken. Avison doesn't deal damage oh. to. Yeah, it's itself. I don't. Uh, it does deal damage to you. It's I don't creatures think. and then yeah. We'll take a look at flip Avison. I don't know why I thought that was the case. That just might be my fault. Deals yeah, damage three, to each, oh, each oh, other yeah, creature. creature Sorry, I don't know why I thought it was uh, that Rill will take three damage. My apologies to everyone at home. Uh, it looks like Eric Rills just wins game one now as a result. So actually, finding Hangerback Walker off of cracking those clues was yep. very important. Right, right, right. So you could transform. Need, need the flip. Yep. My apologies, everybody at home. Let's take a look at the sideboards here as Rill is up a game. We'll take a look at Tom Ross and his four Needle Spires, four Reckless Bushwhackers, a Griff's Boon, a Silk Wrap, two Stasis Snare, two Gideon, Allies, and a Car, and one Repel the Abominable. So I don't think this is the kind of matchup where Tom is going to want to go to the the red package here with the Reckless Bushwhackers and the, the Gideon. Um, I would imagine he wants the fourth copy of Griff's Boon, and he probably wants some of the creature removal and the Silk Wrap and the Stasis Snare. It is easy to overdo that kind of stuff it, by diluting his deck of threats and by adding exposure to Dramoka's command, but on the balance, I think he needs to clear out the, the big blockers that Rill's bringing to the table. Other side of things here for Rill, two dead protectors, three aerial volleys, a Dragon Lord Dramoka, a Linvala the Preserver, a Planet Outburst, a Secure the Waste, two Declaration in Stone, a Hollowed Moonlight, two Evolutionary Leap, and then a Tragic Arrogance. Uh, cheap removal and sweepers. Um, Planet Outburst and Tragic Arrogance are a little bit on the slow side, but they're likely to be game winners if they show up on time. Uh, the two copies of Declaration in Stone, also just good cheap removal, try to stabilize the game early on. Well, these players will shuffle up, get ready here for game number two. So we will talk about something we saw take place in that game, a little clue token action. That's Max Fidi, everybody. He did win our Season 1 Invitational, so he got the right to be a clue token, put his likeness on a card, because when you do win an Invitational, you get that. You also get $10,000 and invite to our player championship, a nice little trophy as well. So I know a lot of people are wondering how you can go about getting this token. Well, Patrick can tell you how to do that right now. Yeah, a variety of ways. You can attend any of our Opens or any of our Classics on the SEG Tour throughout the duration of Season 2. If you can't make it out to one of our large events, any order from StarCityGames.com, $5 or greater will be shipped out with this token. We've got another invitation that will come down the pipeline about a month in New Jersey. We'll have the new champion with a new token. So if you want to get your hands on the Max McVitie Clue token, either show up to one of our large events on the SEG Tour. And if you can't make it out, just place an order from the website, $5 or greater. Congratulations again to Max McVitie, our Season 1 Invitational Champion. We will see him at the Players' Championship at the end of the year. We might see both of these players as well as they get ready here for game number two. Eric Rill currently up a game with green-white tokens. So, in reality, in reality, what it was about there, maybe was the Declaration in Stone the Archangel Avison. Who knows? Well, I think that, that Tom's putting himself in a position there where he beats almost anything except for Hanger back on zero. Mm -hmm. If he exiles the Archangel Avacyn, he still can't really attack because he's going to trade with a bunch of the Hangerback Walkers. A bunch of them will break. There'll be a bunch of Thopters in play. And at that point, even just beating a Planeswalker might be challenging. So uh, it was a risky play, but I think Tom was giving Rill a couple draw steps between his, his natural draw step and the clues he got to break to find one of his two remaining Hangerback Walkers at most, mm -hmm. and almost any other draw step's not going to get it done. I mean, I guess Tragic Arrogance gives him a shot if that happens to be in the main deck, but um, Eric is drawing very thin at that point. Not a whole lot of outs. Eric will take a look at six. Tom has already kept his seven. He will keep. Now he will scry. Top card will stay on top. We're underway, and no one drop from Tom Ross. That is a little surprising. There's Knight of the White Orchid. Pass the turn back. 
You don't find that very often from the human deck, but that just means that his hand is probably loaded up with the cards like Thaddeus Lieutenant. It's also possible that he gets away from some of the one drops in the matchup because they are, you know, a lot of them are just two ones without powers. And against a deck with Hangerback Walker and Sylvan Advocate, that's not necessarily where he wants to be. That's fair. Expedition Envoy, Dragon Hunter, not looking great in the face of a card like Sylvan Advocate. Over at Tom Ross we go. He'll draw. Picked up a copy of Dragon Hunter. Now he's got to figure out how he wants to sequence. Looks like a Dragon Hunter thought he was a tenant. Grow the squad. Get in with the knight. No good blocks for the advocate. Real falls down to 17. Now he's got a couple three power threats in the face of Sylvan Advocate. Thalia's lieutenant likely to be able to get to that size next turn as well. Yep. Real will play a forest. Now Jamoka's command here from Eric would be pretty nice, turning Sylvan Advocate into a 3-4. Mm -hmm. That would help it reign supreme on this battlefield. But if Rill just passes with the mana up, likely represents that Dromoka's command is there, and Ross can simply build up his board and pass the turn back. Here's an attack with Sylvan Advocate. Tom might want to double block here. I think he might be thinking, what's the worst that could happen? Yeah, I suppose with Dromoka's command, if it's plus one, plus one in fight, it, wa it washes out the same way. Mm -hmm. I guess he could plus one, plus one and fight down the white of the Night Orchid and still kill the two creatures that Ross has. Yep. So That means he'd lose his whole squad. Right, that, that makes me think maybe he should not be blocking. He's going to block with Dragon. Okay, Hunt. so this is a way of inducing the Dromoka's command if it's there without losing everything. Okay. We'll put a plus one, plus one counter and fight. So Tom's two biggest creatures are dead, but maybe the best of the bunch of the value is actually left over. Yep. Draw a card. It's a planes. Tom might be able to unload now. And I like that play there from Tom because Sylvan Advocate has vigilance. His hand is sort of forced. If he doesn't block there, Real passes and says go, and now Tom's in the same spot next turn when he goes to attack. So the block is really efficient in the event that Real doesn't have Dromoka's command, and it at least... Gives you the information right away if he does have it. Mm -hmm. Here's an attack for three. Pass the turn back. Over to Real we go. Real will draw. Canopy Vista. And there's an advocate. And Rill has another Dromoka's command in hand. Curious if he wants to use that now or wait. Looks like he's going to use it now. Counter, take care of the lieutenant. That's a 3-4. Thaddeus lieutenant to draw there for Ross. He's going to play always watching now, though. And now here comes Knight of the White Orchid as a 3-3, three, three, but Anointed Our Champions is hanging out there to make it a 4-4. Four, four. Right, just large enough here for to allow Tom to keep punching at least for this turn. Um, but... The, the board is starting to get a little locked up for Tom, and he's running light on resources. Three of an inspector plus a clue, so maybe some more resources on the way. Yep. And Rill's draw this turn looked to be an Archangel Avison. Pretty big one there for Eric. We've now hit the stage of the game where if Rill has one of his high impact fives, be it Archangel Avison or Tragic Arrogance, uh, Ross is low enough on resources that it's going to be hard for him to, to mount much of an offense going forward. Mm-hmm. Three four Sylvan Advocate coming in. Looks a little bit suspicious. But the reality is that Eric Grill has Archangel Avison. So Tom's board right now is a 3 3 Knight of the White Orchid and a 2 3 Thraven Inspector. So I think we might just see a double block here, yeah. And this forces the Archangel now, which makes it so that Eric's stuff is indestructible and Tom will lose his Knight of the White Orchid. And again, because Sylvan Advocate has vigilance, it, Tom's hand is sort of forced. Mm -hmm. If he doesn't do it now, it's going to just happen next turn. Stasis near the draw there for Ross.
start by cracking the glue. Draw a card. Battlefield Forge. He'll play a land. Pass the turn back. Let's go back over to Eric Rill. Rill will draw. Evolving Wilds. Sacrifice that right away. Get a basic forest. And that's land number six, which means Advocate right now is a 5-6. Vigilant's so critical in this kind of matchup because Real needs to be able to apply pressure while blocking. Mm -hmm. Don't want to give Tom all the time in the world to assemble a huge board and go around your blockers. Might be time for the old stasis snare. Yeah, I'm going to take care of the Sylvan Advocate. So four damage to be dealt. Ross can fall down to 16. Can he beat Avacyn? Yeah, painful to have to get rid of the Advocate instead of Avacyn, but it's much more likely Tom can size up to brawl through Avacyn than a 5-6 Sylvan, uh, Sylvan Advocate at this point. I think we might be getting tragic here, Patrick. That's bad news for Tom. That means he's going to let, Eric's going to let him keep always watching and Thraven Inspector. That means Eric gets a Sylvan Advocate back. Yeah, and, and Tom is going to be in the Abyss soon. Yep. It's a Plains for Ross. He'll pass the turn back over to Rill. For real, no stranger to top eights on the SCG Tour. Again, remember, he has won five SCG Tour Opens. I know this is going to be his last one for a little while as he does play a hanger back walker there for three. He might be working his way towards number six in just a second. Not the biggest name in the crowd. He was two, among them two years ago. Yeah. Front half of 2014. Looked like he, both he and Ken Ketter were going to be in the Players' Championship. Yeah. He posted a lot of very good finishes. But Eric just sort of stopped showing up to events. But yeah, he slowed down. He has a number of wins across a variety of formats. He'll sacrifice a clue to draw a card. Picked up an Oath and this Also has a Declaration in Stone. He'll start with the Oath. Take a look at the top couple. Gideon is what he'll be taking with him. Hangerback Walker, Sylvan Advocate are going to come in. Ross will draw. He's at one. There's an Expedition Envoy. You can see those uh, those one drops, they fall off a cliff pretty quick. There's a Declaration in Stone. Going to take care of the Expedition Envoy. He'll sacrifice a clue, draw a card, and that is going to do it. Eric Rill's going to win this match here over Tom Ross. Two games to zero. Green-white tokens will take care of white-red humans. And for Eric Rill... It's another top eight and potentially a sixth SCG Tour open win.